My name is uh, Steve Redding. I'm a co-director of the Griswold Center for Economic Policy Studies, uh, joined with uh, Ileana Kuziemko. Um, it's a great honor to, to introduce today's speaker today, um, Professor Lord Nicholas Stern. Uh, Nick needs no introduction. Um, he's one of the first economists to draw attention to the challenges of climate change, in particular in his pathbreaking Stern Review on the economics of climate change all the way back in 2006, so way ahead uh, of the debate. Um, he holds the IG Patel Chair of Economics and Government at the London School of Economics, as well as a glittering array of other positions, honors, and awards, uh, which include Chair of the Grantham Research Institute, uh, Chair of the Center for Climate Change Economics and Policy, Director of the India Observatory, and Fellow of the Royal Society. Uh, we're privileged that Nick was able to make it here to campus in Princeton today, en route uh, to the uh, Coalition of Financiers meetings in Washington, D.C., and the subsequent World Bank IMF annual meetings. Uh, we're looking forward to a fascinating talk on new approaches to the economics of climate change, urgency, scale, and opportunity. Uh, Nick is going to aim to talk for around uh, 40 minutes, uh, followed by questions and discussion uh, from the floor. And so, Nick, it's a great pleasure now uh, to hand over uh, to you. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. That, that was very kind. Um, I suppose the first thing to check is the microphone works. You're right at the back there? Yep. Um, and uh, it's a pleasure to be back here in Princeton and to see so many, um, I shouldn't say old friends, but long standing friends that uh, <laughs> being back is, uh, is very special. Um, I'm going to um, I think obviously say what I think should be done from a policy perspective. But I want to also look quite hard at what economics has contributed and uh, to raise some challenges to economics, because I think as economists, we haven't done as well as we should have done uh, on what is obviously, uh, I hope, obviously, the, one of the really great, arguably the greatest challenges of our time. But at the same time, I want to be uh, moderately optimistic about what economics can uh, contribute. Whether I'm optimistic about where we end up as a world is a separate question. But I do think that having chastised economics a bit, I also want to be positive about what it can do and where it can go, and actually now where it's beginning to go. So that's what I want to uh, try to achieve. Um, Steve, you're going to have to make sure I do stay to something like 40 minutes so that uh, there's lots of time to uh, talk. Okay. Well, I'll try to be. I'll try to be this one. <laughs> so this is the uh, structure of what I have to say. I think, uh, for uh, in many ways, economics has been missing in action, and uh, when it has been in action, it's often been not always, but often been misdirected. So I'll start by uh, some chastisement, but I'll move on to more uh, positive uh, story. I'll try to describe how we should look at the issues. That doesn't mean that. I can give you really good theory on each of the bits uh, that I'll describe. So it'll be a story of agenda setting, but also, I hope, some um, statements, some ideas about how we can pursue it. Uh, then I'll talk um, using a bit more classical um, approaches to economics through market imperfections of various kinds, market absences, and what that tells us about policy. A little bit of time on values, which I think have been a bit superficial in this area, but which are critical, of course, to what we do. Lastly, uh, where we can go from here. So that's the, uh, that's the story. The first, the little bit of chastisement of economics been missing in uh, action. And I don't think that the statement that this is of huge importance and that economics has potentially a lot to contribute, I don't think that statement should be controversial. But if you look at, this is now from September 2019, I haven't gone back, and it was Andrew Oswald that did most of the uh, chasing uh, on all this. But clearly, the Quarterly Journal of Economics then held some sort of record with uh, no articles ever published on climate change. But, you know, and, you know, the American Economic Review, the Economic Journal, a little, uh, little better. But uh, basically, you know, on a subject of this magnitude, if you took some other subject, important, but of lesser magnitude, you'd have much bigger numbers than uh, this. So that's the story of uh, missing in action. Now, this is where I think economics should go, 
with the implied criticism that it hasn't done enough in these areas. So basically, we have um, come to the conclusion from the science You've got to be very careful, and Angus, who's sitting there somewhere, will be very careful uh, about the use of the word we. But it seems to me that the science has indicated that um, there is a tremendous risk out there, and I'll describe some of it. I hope most of it is uh, familiar to you. And that to keep that risk in manageable proportions, we have to act very quickly. So to keep 1.5 degrees, and I'll come back a little bit to that, in, uh, within reach, we have to go to net zero uh, emissions by uh, 2050, and we have to start turning down really now and move down very strongly during this decade. So, have some chance, reasonable chance, of keeping 1.5 degrees within reach, and I'll come to why we'd want to do that. Net zero should be obvious in the sense that um, the, if you want to stabilize temperatures, you've got to stabilize concentrations and stabilize the concentrations means a net flow of zero. That should be obvious. And the earlier you get to net, the earlier you get to net zero, you know, checking on what path of course you take, but the earlier you get to net zero, the lower the temperature which we take by. So we have to act very quickly. So urgency and scale. Time is of the essence. There's no room here for economics that says, here's one equilibrium, change that policy or parameter, here's another equilibrium. And if the second equilibrium looks better than the first, then that's a good policy. That we haven't got this time is of the essence of time. There's fundamental uncertainty and extreme risk. We're talking about possibilities at three, even with two, but three, four degrees, which are certainly possible, that uh, you're going to see uh, mass movement and mass death. Could be hundreds of millions, could be billions. But how do we deal? in economics with that kind of risk. Expected utility looks a bit feeble in that kind of, what does it really mean? You know? Anyway, that's what we have to think about. In order to get to net zero at the kind of pace that we need, there's going to have to be fundamental structural change in the way we run our cities, energy systems, transport, land. And how do we get that kind of structural change in real time? And within that structural change, very rapid technological change as well. Uh, we can see that's what we have to do. How can we make that happen at the pace that uh, is necessary? Um, the, um, this is a, a story of market failure on a grand scale, and I'll come to it. Number one will be the greenhouse gas externality, of course, but there are others that we really have to tackle. There's a question of policy across a number of fronts. The value, values and discounting, how we look at the benefits and costs of future generations relative now does matter, but also, of course, within generations. So I, these are five areas where I hope what I've said already means takes us to the conclusion that we really have to get together with those things, where I think it's fair to say, whilst economics has done a bit, it hasn't moved fast enough. So I've got to be very careful with we, but uh, sometimes, I mean, we as economists, Sometimes I mean Joe Stiglitz and myself. You know, sometimes I mean the world as a whole. And you'll, have to, you'll have to interpret, but I'll try to avoid it as, uh, as, as best I can. So the first is to recognize, and I can't go into any of the details. There are loads of references at the end that you can look up. But if we're thinking about risk, we have to recognize there are a lot of tipping points out there, some of which we may be already fairly close to. We don't know how close we are to collapsing the Amazon rainforest system. It may be fairly close. The release of methane from the permafrost could be a very big thing. And you can see each of these things would actually feed a very powerful feedback loop, which would make instability a really very big uh, issue. You know, the, the West Antarctic ice sheet, because that's on the land, obviously. Um, if you're looking at the effect on um, uh, sea levels from just warming of water, that's a modest effect that takes place uh, uh, over quite long periods of time. But if you have uh, land-based ice sliding into the sea, well, I mean, you all remember Archimedes' principle, that could give you pretty rapid sea level rise. And these, again, not to go into uh, 
detail. But this is a story where, you know, even at the 1.1 degree centigrade uh, average, average global surface temperature above the uh, second half of the 19th century, the usual benchmark, even at 1.1, we're seeing effects much more severe than we might have thought a few years ago. Uh, and um, those kinds of things are taking us quite close to tipping point, which means, as I've already indicated, potential huge uh, losses of life, mass movement uh, of people. This, then, is what many of the economic models, uh, five, six degrees, you lose 10% of GDP. That does seem to seem to be very hard to square with what I've just been describing. And if that happened 100 years from now, that you got to 5 or 6 degrees and you lost 10% of GDP and you'd grown quite a lot in the meantime, why would you bother? Yeah? It's, well, that's all right. You know? We're twice as well off then as we are now, so we lost 10%. Not a big deal. And it just doesn't seem consistent with the uh, phenomena that we have uh, been described. This is now a, a description. There have been six IPCC uh, assessment reviews you know, of the body of evidence, and plus one, and that is the difference between 1.5 and 2. And you can see that the difference between 1.5 and 2 is potentially very large. I mean, just take, I haven't, again, I haven't got time to go into detail, but if you just take the first row here, in exposure to extreme heat once every five years. Well, if it's extreme enough to kill you once every five years, it's quite scary, right? So, um, you know, 14% of the population versus 37, you have to regard that as a really big difference between 1.5 and 2. And that's what really brought down between uh, Paris and COP21 in 2015 and Glasgow COP26 uh, last year, last uh, November. That's what really led the world as a whole to bring down the uh, target from well below 2 degrees to 1.5. All the time we're starting to understand that each 0.1 degree is big, that 0.5 and then the next 0.5 and the next point is enormous. So that's really the statement I've already made, is where to really have a chance of holding to 1.5 degrees centigrade, or even well below 2. That means a very rapid change. Probably something like 40% reductions in this decade, which is already you know, two years old, and uh, net zero by 2050. And I've already said that means cities, land, energy trans transforming those systems. This isn't a bit of a tweak here and a bit of a tweak there, or you know, carbon price and a few dollars here and a carbon price. This is something big. And so our challenge then is to how do we, as a world, foster that claim? How could it, you don't want the we, how could it happen? What would be uh, involved? And we should recognize, of course, that change of that magnitude does involve dislocation and disequilibrium, which we're going to have to manage along the way. Now, I'm jumping ahead here, um, and I won't say very much about it, but if you look at changes in the energy and transport systems and uh, you know, sustainable infrastructure, if you look at the food and land systems and natural capital and so on, and try to ask what kinds of investment by geography, by sectors, could give you the kind of change which we're describing. Now, this, this is work which I've been associated with, but it has not been my work. It's been led by um, um, Amar Bhattacharya, Homi Karas, and others at uh, Brookings. Um, that this is the kind of numbers they come up with. Um, if you just look, for example, at 2030 uh, and putting the first row to one side, we wanted to emphasize that we're not forgetting human capital. There are all sorts of other reasons here that really matter. But if you look at sustainable infrastructure, food and agriculture and nature and adaptation and resilience, you're talking about uh, increases in um, investment of ballpark two and a half three percentage point of world GDP. Now, in a world where, you know, for a while now, planned saving has been less than, planned saving has been, has been big in relation to planned investment, that should be perfectly possible. And, and in, you know, if you look back over the G7 economies 15, 20 years ago, they did have investment rates 
which were you know two three percent higher than now. So that's nothing wild from the point of view of history or the point of view of um, world macro, but it's big, and we have to recognise that these kind of scale of investment are necessary, and it's got to move up quickly. So that's an attempt, as it were, to quantify what kinds of investments. And they have to be innovatory investments too, of course, are necessary here. Now, I want to also argue that this could be, if if it's done well, the growth story of the 21st century. By growth story 21st, I, you know, I'm talking really between now and mid-century. I can manage to think, and you can manage to think about 20, 25 years, but it's pointless to think about infinity. I know that positive growth forever is uh, uh, implausible, and, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about how we manage the next 20, 25 uh, years, and could it be a growth story? And basically, we get to net zero not by having zero output and not by having zero uh, population. I hope you'll accept that as a reasonable <laughs> proposition. We get to net zero by breaking the relationship between consumption and production on the one hand and what we do to the environment and the climate on the other. And that's, that's what we uh, have to do. So I, wanted, I want to suggest, that we're going to have to work more on this, of course, but I want to suggest that this could be a real growth story. I've already pointed to the kind of investments that are necessary. That then, those themselves would drive growth. But the kind of investment would also drive growth. This is a lot about resource efficiency, particularly energy efficiency, but resource efficiency across the board. Well, resource efficiency is productivity. That's increased in productivity. There's a tremendous amount of increasing returns to scale. Here. And there are some people in the ro this room who have been quite... Uh, uh, hugely influential in modeling economics with increasing returns to scale. We know that general equilibrium models don't do very well in those circumstances, but we can be much better than that. Huge amounts of this are increasing returns to scale. Increasing returns to scale, we've seen riding down the cost curve for lots of renewables. Increasing returns to scale in discovery. Increasing returns to scale in all kinds of networks. You know, whether it's a uh, that reusing and recycling, or grid structures, or broadband, or transport. You know, these are the all, in all these areas, in all these ways, which are different but complementary. The increasing returns to scale is going to be fundamental. Systemic change. I mean, think of cities where you can move and breathe. This sounds like a good idea, even if you've never heard of climate change. And that's productivity, right? And um, there's also, and, and I, no, I, I'm not sure quite what to do, but I, I do take number four. Seriously, if we really concentrate very hard on something that's important, I mean, take the vaccines for uh, COVID, and that is done in a way that's complementary and pushed across the world at the same time with the benefits of collaboration and competition and so on, then you can get big, uh, big, big change. We've, we've seen that, of course, in during wartime too, as you change economy very quickly. Um, improvement to health is a very big deal. We kill 8, 9, 10 million a year from air pollution. Not all of it from burning fossil fuels, but most of it. That's a, a lot of people. I mean, the number of people who die each year is probably 50-something million. Now, you know, if 8, 9, 10 million associated with air pollution, that's a huge story of, I mean, first and foremost, people dying, but also productivity and growth. And that doesn't count the ones you're maiming uh, along along the way. And finally, the, um, if we all move together, and this is about the moving on scale and collaboration, if I think that many countries around the world are moving very strongly towards zero emission vehicles, zero emission electricity, better materials, green hydrogen, then as an investor and as an innovator, I have a stronger incentive to go after it because I know there's going to be a market out there. So there are all sorts of reasons. Uh, why this could be a growth story if the world acts uh, purposely to make it so. Please don't take this as wild optimism. I am actually very optimistic about what is possible. I'm not necessarily very optimistic about what the world will do. But it seems to me a logical first step is to show what's possible and if we're involved in public policy, and this is a school public policy that we sit in now, we uh, could then ask ourselves, 
how could it be possible to change what uh, is possible into what could happen? So that's the story. You know, it's a, it's, it's a, could well be a growth story which is quite strong in the short period. It'll be strongly Schumpeterian in the short to medium period as a growth story. And there ain't no high carbon growth story over the medium and long term because it just self destructs. So that's the uh, way I think it should go. Let me just spend a moment with um, a little bit of criticism of what happened. Basically, a lot of economics has been, uh, of climate change, has been what they call an integrated assessment model. And um, Bill Nordhaus, you know, way back in the early 90s, built such a thing, and it was a very thoughtful initial step. And it had a growth, underlying growth uh, trajectory, and it said that if we don't manage climate change, we're going to knock that off a bit and we might lose it in the kind of ways I described a little earlier. And that's, you know, you, you, in economics, we generally use our workhorses, growth models, marginal changes, a bit of uncertainty. And as a first step, I think that was reasonable. But actually what we discovered as the, it, from the science um, was that this wasn't simply marginal perturbation stuff. This was much bigger, and basically those models couldn't really handle that kind of story. So what started out as a reasonable first shot somehow got sort of stuck in the arteries of the system and stayed there for uh, a very long time, and we have to try to move out of it. Joe Stiglitz and I, in a paper in the Journal of uh, Economic uh, Methodology, probably not all of you know such a journal exists, that this was about methodology, um, we published a, a, about a year ago, um, argued that in the context of this kind of uncertainty, uh, we need to think hard about what sort of approaches to the uncertainty that we operate. And we suggested that using guardrails, the idea of a guardrail, I mean, if, if you've got, a, if you've got a, a cliff with a footpath, which is, uh, you know, fraying, you might actually put a guardrail. We asked people to use seatbelts, but told them to use seatbelts in cars. And then it seemed to me that these, that kind of approach to potential catastrophic risk for big parts of the world population might be reasonable. I think it would be very good if people who are better philosophers and mathematicians than, uh, than we are, if they could dig down and see what kind of uh, deeper logical structures would give you that kind of outcome. But I do, I do think that the world has got there. I mean, that's what it did in Paris and well below two degrees. That's what it did in. Um, in Glasgow and shifting over to 1.5 and, and so on. That's what the world has seen as a reasonable reaction to this kind of problem. And I think it would be very interesting to look more at, at the you know, mathematical, philosophical underpinnings of that kind of story. But that is where we've got to. And I think most people, I'll be careful here, many people would regard that as a reasonable way to try to uh, tackle all this. Then the economics comes in, because that is underlying economics and setting these guardrails. But how you get there becomes a, an intensely challenging uh, set of economic policy problems. So uh, this is, it, it, I'm telling you what you know here, but it's very important just how fast the costs have uh, fallen in all this. And they've been systematically underestimated each time. Um, the uh, co-benefits now, I think, are starting to be realized, and particularly in, in health and, uh, and so on. So this is a way in which the models, the early models, missed it. They all had increasing marginal costs to action on climate change. And what we've seen, I hope not surprisingly, it goes the other way. And there's every reason to think it will continue for quite a while if you look across you know, electric vehicles, if you look across further advances in uh, renewables, if you look at materials, green hydrogen, storage, and so on, these phenomena are happening right across the board, not surprising as you really get to grips with the uh, new opportunities. So I don't want to be, I won't go into detail here, you know, that if anybody who wants the slides should, should be able to have them and the references are there. But I do think it's fair to say that in more recent integrated assessment models, there has been some progress along the front side of the sky, but I think they're just generically uh, really incapable of handling the stories that uh, we need to tell. And also, when you do start to play with them and change the assumptions, you get 
enormous differences in the result. So if you estimate the social cost of carbon, you know, some kind of discounted integral of, uh, of utility of damages, uh, you find if you fiddle around with these assumptions, you can get more as anything you like. And I think in the, under the Trump administration, they decided the social cost of carbon was, I can't remember, was it two or two, sorry, five? Five, yeah, five. And you know, many of us would argue it's 100. Yeah? But you can, if you want to go from five to 100 or 100 to five, it's rather straightforward. You, know? you just fiddle with a few parameters. But then what does it tell you? Yeah? It's just so sensitive to what you, uh, what you see there. And what Joe and I have, and others have argued, that if you have a target, which is rationally come to through public discussion and so on, if you have a target, then you can ask the question, what kind of price of carbon would lead decision makers to that target? Those of us who, who were involved in public economics, and there are quite a few people in this room, those who were involved in public economics in the 70s, you know, we distinguished clearly between producer prices and consumer prices. The social cost of carbon is more a consumer price, the price that leads you to the uh, kind of constraints that we reckon you, you should be imposing um, would be a producer price. And uh, right through the public economics, you know, sometimes you look at consumer prices, something like this, Diamond and Murley's literature focused largely on producer price. So this is a case where if you look at the producer price side, that kind of extreme sensitivity to assumption is much lower. So uh, that's a uh, Anyway, let me, let me stop criticizing economics and then I say I've worked much of my life in India and uh, the question is what to do? And there are various ways of expressing what to do. You can be what to do purposes, you can be what to do, it's all hopeless, but um, this is a what to do purposes. And what you, what you actually do, right? You, sign, you describe the kind of pathways and changes that you're thinking about, but what kind of policies could take us there? Well, one way of starting is market imperfection, and we focus strongly on that in the uh, Stern Review, but, um, uh, and we, we focus on some of these other market imperfections. But I come to think of six, and none of these six is small. They're all big and highly relevant to the climate change. So I've already spoken about greenhouse gases, Stern Review, we called it the greatest market failure the world has ever seen. I would stick by that. You know, we're all, we all emit, we're all hit by the consequences of emissions, and it's all big. So this is, very, that sense, the greatest market failure the world. So it's number one, don't get me wrong. But don't forget these other five here. R&D, well, it, we, we've known as a profession, and rightly so, that this is that ideas of public goods and there's a serious... Uh, and they are absolutely dead center here. And of course, there's the public good nature, not only of the idea, but also in this context, there's the public good in making use of the idea because it reduces uh, emissions and we're in a great hurry. So this always R&D is important as a source of market failure, but it's particularly important in this context. We know, of course, risk and capital markets in the context of change are going to be their challenge Anyway, but in the context of very rapid change, those are going to be big. And of course, lots of things that uh, you can uh, do about that. And I think the multilateral, in fact, in the questions, we can talk a bit more. But the multilateral development banks and the national development banks have a real role to play in handling long term uh, risk. Um, and anyway, there's more to it than that the role of guarantees and, 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 uh, and so on and equity. Um, networks, and I've already mentioned, but you know, re reusing, recycling, and the, uh, the grid, the electricity grid structures, the broadband structures, public transport, they're all networks, and uh, we know that for networks to function uh, well, you're going to need regulation. And by the way, I, I tend to use on the whole, it, you, you're probably aware that regulation gets up people's noses. They think regulation's a bad thing. Uh, I've always taken the view that we need uh, uh, less uh, bad regulation and more good regulation. But, the, um, but we're actually in a, a state of high frenzy in the UK about regulation. I always use, I try to say standards and regulation and put standards first. You want low standards? Yeah? <laughs> but the, uh, you know, it, just, it all gets too political. But um, you do need uh, standards and regulations for right across in many of these uh, 
many of these things. Information, of course, enormously important here. People need to know what they're buying. Yeah? People need to know what kinds of technological operation, technological stuff is available. Where networks important, they need to know what other people are likely to do. Again, there's stuff you can do, but you have to recognise that it's going to be an important part of public policy. And of course, I've already emphasised the co-benefits, particularly of air pollution, but much more. Co-benefits are a very flat word. I mean, if you're killing eight, nine, ten million people a year, that's what you need some better term anyway. With that's what stuck a bit, so we use uh, co co-benefit, uh, you know, the air pollution and. Uh, I don't know if, it, if the lady is here who earlier today talking about uh, how you tackle air pollution in Surat in India, which is one of the most polluted places uh, around. And there's a, there's a great deal that uh, you can do, and it comes. Some of it, of course, comes with action, which might be motivated first by uh, climate change. So you're going to have to act right across these things. But it's also, of course, absent markets. You can't transact on the technologies that we're likely to need. Uh, 20 years from now. So there's loads of things we can do now on the basis of what we've got, but we're going to need much more. And But we can't now transact on those uh, technologies 20 years from now because we don't quite know what they are. You can't really transact on carbon markets 25, 30 years down. Right. So we know that a general equilibrium with um, absent markets uh, would not necessarily indeed be unlikely to be uh, great or efficient. So, uh, but when we bring in, uh, that it's more than just that negative statement, when we bring in absent markets, expectations become fundamental. You know, whether you're Hayek or Keynes or, or and just a good economist, you know that expectations are fundamental to investment. And the absent market story underlines that. So the credibility of where government uh, policy is going and the institutional structures that could help with that credibility are going to be enormously uh, important. We have some examples that the UK doesn't get everything wrong, but it gets many things wrong. But one thing it got right, I think, is the climate change legislation and the climate change committee, which uh, sets out where, in their view, uh, policy needs to go, assesses how we're doing, and it reports annually on this. And it's actually one institutional structure which Focuses. I mean, it's a bit like the Office of Budget Responsibility, which reports separately on the macro. And having those, and, and indeed the independence of the Bank of England, so far, who knows what's going to happen next. But the, uh, the, the institutional structures really can help with the credibility of policy. And there's some examples that we can, uh, we can uh, offer. Let me spend, how am I doing for, okay. So I'll, I'll, I've got five slides here on um, ethics and values. Which, uh, they're just unavoidable in all this. I know that it makes economists shift around on their backside because they think <laughs> other people should, you know, it should be the Pope or the Chief Rabbi or somebody. But you can't avoid discussion directly of these issues. Much better to do it in a structured, open way than try to pretend that you can get them from somewhere else, somehow. And uh, so uh, people say, what's your discount rate? Well, immediately the discussion started in the wrong place. What matters is discounting. Yeah? And discounting is the relative value of some good. It will depend on which good, but let's say some good now uh, and some good in the future. And it would depend on who's getting the good. And so but let's, let's keep it simple for the minute. So we ask the question, what is that relative valuation, a relative shadow price, or however, whatever language you use? And then discount rate is the proportional rate of fall of the discount factor. But logically, prior is the relative price. Yeah? That's where we should start by thinking discounting. And then if we want to take the log logarithmic differential, as a well, that's fine, we can, right? But Expressing it then as a relative value of a, a good now and a good in the, in the future, immediately you ask, well, what's the position of the people who are receiving that good in the future? If you want to start thinking about it, that's surely where many people would start. Now, of course, that's an approach to ethics, but it's one I think that would be shared quite widely. So what is the position of the person in the future relative to now? They could be extremely poor, 
if we manage climate change very badly. So it's, it's if you excuse the language, it's intensely endogenous. Yeah? You cannot expect to pull in the discount factor and therefore the discount rate from somewhere else because it's part of the story. So you have to bring to the table an explicit discussion of the value. And I think many of us, certainly myself, you know, as I say, myself and other right-minded people, would um, actually want to discuss how that person in the future would be. And of course, it's stochastic, it depends on what we do, but it could be very badly off if we manage climate change badly. So that, I think, is the approach. That, and uh, so I, I shy away from discussions that begin, what is your discount rate? They've sort of missed the point. Yeah? But you know, go back one step, and things are much more clear and uh, structured. There's also pure time discounting, which is um, to say that if you take a, a person now and a person in the future, identical by assumption in all relevant respects, you would uh, attach a lower weight to the welfare of the person in the future, discounting utility and discounting lives. So you would attach a lower weight to a person in the future than now. I think you need a pretty good argument to explain why you'd want to do that. Yeah? It, it, you know, it is discrimination by date of birth, which we wouldn't normally do uh, in front of law courts. And, you know, and um, the, uh, so it, I think the challenge is somebody who thinks there yeah, should be pure time discounting has got to give an argument, and I've never heard a good one. That's separate from whether or not that person exists in the future. So, so if you have a Poisson process with a constant parameter to the first event, and that is disaster that blows the world away, then of course you can get a, a standard uh, eta minus RT uh, or lambda T if that's your Poisson process parameter. You can get that. But that's simply a statement as to, and it could be relevant, but then it seems to me that the exogenous asteroid that's going to blow us apart has a moderately low probability. And certainly not the one or two percent that you would see, you know. And, and, a, and a pure time discount rate two percent, which many people have used, would say that a person that was born thirty-five years later than now, otherwise completely identical, would count for a half. But why do you want to do that? So that's uh, how I think we can think about it. And really, what the one footnote I want to add from this slide is to say that. We kid ourselves if we think the capital market has any serious information on this. Yeah? I mean, our transactions in capital markets are not ethical statements of how we value this generation. They're about returns to ourselves over a period of time. They have interest, of course. I mean, they are interesting I mean, in, in that uh, context. It's not an ethical piece of information. And of course, we know that the capital markets are uh, very imperfect anyway, even if we made the first mistake. The second mistake would be to look at the perfection of those. So there, there's no, there's no route, uh, there's no route uh, there. Um, I would note, and um, our, our great friend, uh, the late Marty Weitzman, who was very much uh, on top of many of these issues. He said, "Look, I keep writing down models where the social cost of carbon is infinite. Something's gone wrong here." And he was right. Something gone wrong with the models, not with his logic. That. Uh, in, in my book, um, Why Are We Waiting, which was the Lionel Robbins lectures at the LSD, published 2015, I go into everything I've done so far is standard economic consequentialism, the way you normally do welfare economics and make judgments. And, and I've stayed largely within that framework. I don't apologize for that. But I also think that we have to look uh, outside that framework as well. And you know, whether you look at Aristotle or Rousseau and Locke or, or Kant, whichever approach it is, I think you will. Always come up with the uh, with the and the Archbishop of Canterbury did read while we waiting and he wrote to me about this. So whether that's any validation at all, I don't know. But the uh, it, it, he didn't he didn't do sort of narrow welfareist consequentialism. He, he he looks at the ethics in other ways, and he was quite quick to come to these conclusions as well. That's a longer conversation. Um, the uh, when we talk about international collaboration in particular, we start to think about obligation and what they mean. And it's fair to say that a lot of the trouble that we're in has come from the rich countries getting rich, not all of it, but a lot of it has come from rich countries getting rich on high carbon 
stroke. So they had made life more difficult for other countries. And um, they may not have done it deliberately, but they did it. You know? And then people put asbestos into roofs and they started killing people down the track. They may not have done it deliberately, but they did it. And uh, there's arguably an obligation uh, there. I think that I would argue that there's an obligation there. And that, in, in my view, is an obligation to help the transformation of poorer countries' economies in this new route, which we can see could be very attractive. But you have to invest to get there, and you need finance for that uh, investment to get. Also, there's a lot to say about collaboration and how we work together. And again, I haven't got time to go uh, into that. But collaboration really does have very big returns. You know, it's, it's the story of increasing investment. It's the story of the power of common uh, expectations to drive innovation investment. There's the increasing returns to scale that uh, I've emphasized. And of course, obviously, and it's where we begin, uh, climate is public good. There are all kinds of returns to collaboration as well. And we can talk about the underlying uh, series of collaboration and how we can work to make that uh, happen. Justice appears is a word that appears very often in this context. And, you know, it, if, if you say that things are unjust, it, it, it could just be, you know, adolescent complaint. I don't like that, so it's unjust. So we have to be a bit more systematic than that. I found Amartya Sen's approach to all this quite helpful in thinking about the story. He, uh, Amartya argues that it's quite difficult to define a fully just system, but you can identify injustice. And for him, and, and the, the idea of justice is a really great book, it's about 13 years old now, but essentially he argues that an injustice is a, um, is a right or an entitlement denied. That, of course, shifts the argument, well, what to write. Yeah? And in this context, I think one that would be appealing is a right to development. I mean, in some sense, the pursuit of happiness, which is familiar to uh, a U.S. audience, is a right to explore your life, to try to uh, follow whatever it is that you value. And so that's how I think a right to development has, has gained traction, and I find that uh, a helpful way to think about it. So it's unjust if somehow you violate somebody's right to development, and there you can organize your thoughts in that way around how much more difficult you have made for other people if you uh, emit greenhouse gases. Notice that I wouldn't try to offer a right to emit. Emissions kill people. I mean, what, what kind of right is that? But the right to development is a right to pursue uh, the life that, that you have reached value. And uh, that has been common in many sort of philosophical approaches, certainly you know, around the French Revolution and uh, US independence and, and so on. And I think it does, as an empirical matter, have traction, and I think philosophically uh, also. So that's a one way of organizing your thoughts in the meaning of justice and injustice. And then, of course, you get to the it, justice, the transition itself. There's dislocation. People who decided to work in coal mines, they may not have had much choice, but they decided to work in coal mines. And now we realize that those jobs are going to have to go to, in order to get to the kinds of outcomes. You know, um, I'm using we as a logical deduction there. I mean, you, you, you can't get to net zero if you have lots of uh, coal mines and coal fired power stations. So you've got to find ways of um, scaling those down if you scale up the uh, alternatives. And so those kinds of dislocation, I think, are also raising questions of justice uh, as, as well. And that's become very strong in the language uh, here. And we have uh, people talking about, and I think understand it. So, just energy transition path. Jet P is a is a, an acronym that you will either have come across or you will. So, lastly, then um, uh, it's really I'm circling back to where I began. I think that economics has a tremendous amount to contribute, and here are areas where surely we all recognise that economics has got a lot to contribute. It simply doesn't look very much like the economics of climate change that has uh, come to us. But I've tried to give an argument about why we really can do this. And I, I'm a big, I mean, how could I not be a big fan of economics? But I'm a big fan of economics in this context 
as to what it could contribute. Just a bit disappointed it hasn't done enough of it fast enough, but it can, and I hope it will. And the young people now coming through really want to do this stuff. I mean, 20 years ago, environment and economics might have seen as a bit soft, but now I think it's seen as real tough frontier uh, challenge, and that's a, a great change, and it's coming. So this is the kind of agenda, and so this is my uh, last slide. Again, circling back to what I said to, at the beginning, fundamental economic change at real pace. That's what the profession should be getting good at and contributing uh, to. And it goes all the way from the micro up to the big uh, everything. And that's because that's the nature of the problem. It's got to be micro, structural, systemic, macro. That, that is what comes at us. It's not one They've all got to, we've got to assemble them uh, in a strong way. We all know that the political economy is hard, and that, of course, has to be explicitly part of the discussion. And so much of economics comes together. The international, industrial, labor, health, education, a whole lot. But that means that we're going to have some people working in very focused ways on these bits and that bit, and uh, others are going to try and put it all uh, together. But that's the nature of the beast. And, uh, but it's a very exciting, I think, future for our subject. And I get a little optimistic when I start to see the young people particularly moving very strongly in that direction, some of whom I met today here at Princeton. So thank you very much. We just want people to be ready to do that. Really, really, one point you came on the way. So that's good. It, it's um, I mean, it, 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 it's very big and, it, and it's fundamental that that question. It, it is the case that uh, those who are hit hardest are, in general, those who've contributed the least to the problem, and that's part of the injustice in in the system. Um, you know, when I spoke about justice as being rights or entitlement denied, I think we would think particularly hard about if they were being denied to very poor people. There's an intersection of those two uh, perspectives. Um, the, there's a great deal countries can do by themselves, and uh, thinking through about what those are. And actually, Bangladesh, for example, is quite good at early warning systems from um, storm surges uh, and so on. There's lots of, and India, India's not bad as well. There, so there's quite a lot of countries can do themselves. You know, expanding mangroves again, you know, it gives you, they're, they're great at capturing carbon. And they are good at the storm surges, stopping the storm surges, and of course they're good for the shrimp and even good for the tigers in the field. <laughs> so there's there's lots that you can do uh, as a country, and uh, increasingly you're seeing that activism and not not being passive, not just waiting, but actually going after what really matters, including on the emissions, even though they might have small emissions. Um, the second thing is is that I do think that the way you Pose the question in the first place, which I would go along with, does suggest an obligation from the richer countries to help in that uh, process. And for me, it's helping that investment and innovation process along the way, helping the conditions for investment and innovation, and helping with the with, with climate. And you know, people aren't always that bad. You know, I, I do think there are there's some recognition. Is that important? And where I'm going tomorrow um, for the uh, bank fund meeting, 
the most powerful way to do that is to expand the lending capacity of the multilateral development bank. It costs very little to do that. And uh, the, uh, it, the numbers really are, are, are you know, are very uh, impressive. For a $20 billion one-shot capital increase, you could probably double the stream of flow of lending from those uh, banks. You know, through the magic of use of capital, paid in capital and callable capital, and so on. So there is a way that actually we can bring low cost capital pretty cheaply. So Janet Yellen has been talking about that. Yeah, Larry, has, Larry Summers has put on to it finally. And um, there, there is, I think, uh, it's something which I think India, and I'm working closely with them, will uh, make a big deal in their presidency of the G20. So mobilizing those low cost capital flows, uh, which doesn't cost that much to make a very big difference, particularly if it's worked much more closely with the private sector and managing and reducing private sector risk, will be a big part of that uh, story. Sorry, no, please. Thank you. Please uh, first off, thank you very much for taking the time to speak to us. Uh, personally, I got a lot out of this. But my question is, do you have any opinions about the Inflation Reduction Act, what it does right, what it does wrong, and what it does not enough? Um, yes, but they are not based on the very detailed scrutiny that I'm assuming that you have given to the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, let me remark that they illustrate one thing that I tried to bring out, which was there are a whole load of um, market failures that we need to deal with. Number one was the greenhouse gas failure. Um, and you would want to think about the carbon price as part of that. There's lots you can do with standards and regulation as well. So for example, in the UK, we have said there will be no sale of internal combustion engine vehicles after 2030. And I think that's actually quite an interesting, useful policy, because if you've got increasing returns to scale and not to uncertainty, that kind of confidence from a clear uh, standard is also helpful. But um, I don't think I'd be alone in this room of suggesting that you're not going to get a carbon price in the United States anytime soon. Yeah? And uh, that's not a very deep observation, but I think it's correct. Yeah? So what do you do? You say, oh, I studied economics, and the only thing that's going to work is a carbon price. We find a carbon price. We're all sunk. That's not true. Right? There's so many other things that you can do. There are arguments for subsidies, you know, R&D subsidies, and with economies of scale. The argument for certain kinds of stuff, not any old stuff, but certain kinds of substances, even if you've got a carbon price. Yeah? So um, but if you haven't got a carbon price, you've got to be more of that sort of stuff. And that's the way I offer the somewhat charitable interpretation of the inflation. Thank you. Hi, uh, thanks so much for the talk. I, I um I was uh, really interested in your perspective on on the UK. I'm I'm, I'm an external member of the uh, Bank of England's Financial Policy Committee, which, as you know, is kind of seized with the risks associated with climate change. And I was, so my question is is uh, related to a couple of things. Kind of specifically, you know that there's been some work done on scenario analysis to try to get your our arms around you know, the risks that are physical in, tra in transition. Um, but at the same time, it's pretty rudimentary. It doesn't take into account the true stochastic nature of the issue. It treats kind of transi transition and physical as being separate. And so if you had some advice for central bankers on how to improve that so we can actually make better use of these kinds of analysis, what would it be? And then the more general question is central banks um, and I went through a, you know, a real soul searching of what really should be their role in climate change. And some have gone for the really narrow role, some have gone for a bigger one. What would be your advice in terms of central bankers and what they should, how they should interact and kind of move this whole agenda forward? Well, thank you for helping us at our time of need. And um, <laughs> I, uh, I assume that you've been up some nights in the last <laughs> week or two. Yeah? Uh, many people, but perhaps not all of you, will know that um, a couple of weeks ago, um, the UK government uh, announced 
uh, rather major tax cutting uh, program uh, without anything else. So uh, the markets took a dim view of this and uh, the cost of, you know, the price of, of guilt and government bonds uh, plummeted uh, as a result. And a lot of pension funds who, for whom those were fundamental sources of capital found themselves because they've used, borrowed against those capital in very complicated uh, um, instruments. Um, and they found themselves in a very difficult position because their collateral had suddenly collapsed. Right? And collapse is the right, the right word. Uh, so um, our friends, I mean, John Kingman and John Tunliff and uh, George Carolyn, up all night on uh, this, wondering what to do. So instead of the quantity of tightening that had previously been announced, they started buying up these uh, bonds because otherwise these pension funds would have gone to the wall. And it would not have been a pretty sight that had uh, happened. So that's, that's, that's what uh, was there. Um, anyway, that was just thanking you for, <laughs> that wasn't, that wasn't about climate, that wasn't, that, that wasn't about, that wasn't about climate change. Um, I think, and you must have worked quite closely with Sarah Breeden at the Bank of England. Now, Sarah Breeden is a very senior official at the Bank of England looking after this stuff. And, you know, there is a, uh, there's a real problem is that the models that we've got, which are formal models of all this, badly understate the risk. Now, a central bank will quite understandably, and, 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 and an economist will quite understandably, oh, give me a model. You know? I've got to have a model. So you've got a model, but it's very misleading. For exactly the reasons that you described and I tried to describe. Sarah Breen, and she's the official at the Bank of England responsible for this, absolutely gets it. But it's quite hard to do, and I think we, and I, here I'm talking about fellow economists, it must try to do better to help with trying to bring to the table those sorts of risks so that their sensitivity analysis, scenario analysis, can be a bit better in, in the form. Um, so there's work, there's work to do on that, but at least there's openness, clear openness and demand for that work within the, uh, within the Bank of England. Um, and the network on greening the financial system, I'm sure you'll, it has over 100 countries involved in that, including the United States and China and, and most of the big economies of the world. So they exchange ideas on how to, from the monetary macro point of view, how to, and financial, how to uh, approach the issues. So at least there's a shared interest. But within that, there are very different perspectives, as, as you know. There are there are institutional fundamentals. We were used to we used to market fundamentalism, yeah? but there's institutional fundamentalism as well. That the job of the Bank of England is price stability, full stop. Bring anything else, and you're muddling the water. And that seems to me to be understandable, but I disagree. You know, there um, we know. I mean, if you just go back to ordinary. Second best welfare economics, the public economics of the 70s. You know that if prices can be very misleading in certain ways, some may be fine, but then you should be bringing, as it were, the market imperfection into your decisions across the board. You should be understanding what they mean. And it seems to me that that is a reasonable approach to um, institutional responsibility. There can be a primary one. Indeed, there should be a primary one. You need the clarity. But if you say you can't think about anything else, then it seems to me you're losing uh, unnecessarily the ability to influence things that really, really matter. So the stability of the economy as a whole, so the welfare and the, the growth, and everything that counts on the, the macro side. So I do think it should be fair. Uh, the letter from Rishi Sunak, the previous Chancellor of the Exchequer, to the, to the, to the government of Bangladesh, essentially says to take account of. And that seems to me to be fine. Yeah? But to say you should take no account of, which is the sort of the institutional fundamentalist position, I think that's bad economics. Um, it might help you with your notion of the purity of the institution, but that seems to me to be, uh, to be too rigid in this context.
how you take it into account, and you've got scenario analysis. And I do think the task force on climate-related financial disclosure, which Mike Bloomberg and Mark Carney uh, put into place, and is now legally, as you know very well, uh, uh, since April this year, you, you have your financial institution, you have to disclose your exposure to carbon risk. And that seems to me to be, you know, transparency is a great thing, and that will, I think, help move uh, things along. So those kinds of things are what uh, what I would uh, I'd point to. I can't tell you you should do exactly this, but I think I try to indicate what you could look at. Okay. Yeah. Thanks a lot for your great talk and very refreshing to hear some self critique of the economic discipline. But you've been a, uh, at the forefront of this anyway. I have two questions. One is on your, your point of international collaboration, which you stressed, which is one of these reinforcing factors. As I see it, I think we're rather entering this, this um, international um, competition space where, of course, China and also the EU have pushed for a green industrial policy. But also, I think this is now with the Inflation Reduction Act. That's kind of what the US is, seems to follow. Is this, um, is this a problem in your perspective? Or is it maybe also an opportunity because there's more, you know, Political will then to be uh, ambitious. I think Obama had a science piece. Of course, it wasn't written by him, but I think John Holdren uh, wrote a very nice uh, article in his name and, and message to Trump that actually that's the way to go because if we don't follow, then we lose out. So that's my first thing. What's your take on this? Is there maybe a role for both to play? And the second thing is very unrelated. How do we bring all of this into econ classrooms? Because if yeah, if I, my experience personally is with my <coughs> students that I have that, that, that did undergrad in econ, they learned about climate change in environmental econ classes, and there it's really treated as, you know, the negative environmental externality. And, and the only question is prices mm. versus quantities. And that's, that's it. And all these other market failures, which in my eyes are sometimes even bigger, um, or cannot be, as you say, right, cannot be ignored at all, or completely ignored in those classes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I, as an empirical statement, I think that's true, right? The, uh, and not just not just here. Um, on collaboration across nations, um, the in a world where and let, let's take the United States and China. You know, let's start with the biggest <laughs> example. Um, in a world where collaboration on technology is going to be hard, collaboration on defense is going to be hard, collaboration on trade. Is going to be hard. Uh, collaboration on climate is going to be easier than that. It not easy. It's going to be easier than that because there's a very clear common uh, interest. I mean, at uh, I think it was two or three days before the end of um, the Glasgow COP26 summit last November, uh, the United States and China made a joint declaration on climate, collaboration on technology, and so on. Now, um, that came in, in large measure from you know, the good relationships over time between the climate negotiators on those particularly, uh, Todd Stern's out not doing that now, but Todd Stern, John Kerry on the one hand, and Xi Jinping on the other. And you know, Todd used to famously take uh, Xi Jinping to Chicago Cup. Games and stuff. But they knew each other for a long time. And uh, you know, they say in China, old friends are good friends. So, in other words, extended collaboration over a long period of time builds, not always, it depends on behavior, but it can build some kind of trust. And it, it, there is a clear common interest there. And the um, uh, if you can collaborate on one thing, I like to think that you're more likely at least to listen to each other. I wouldn't put it more strongly than that, but listen to each other on other things. And that seems to me to be an added reason. I mean, the reasons collaboration on climate are overwhelming, but there's an added reason that it can improve relationships on uh, other things. Now, that collaboration on climate, I hope it was suspended rather than abolished over Nancy Pelosi's visit to. Uh, Taiwan. But I'm hopeful that that will eventually uh, uh, go away uh, under the recognition of, of common interests. In other areas, I think competition is enormously 
it's not good for the world that China, that China has this big monopoly on production telephone or the processing of various Bora and others. So I think one of the good things to the earlier gentleman's question, you know, the, the, the legislation in the US, I think the support for the production of solar panels in the United States is extremely important. And uh, in India, that's starting to move as well. Certainly Reliance and other big houses are moving very strongly in India on the production of solar panels. If you have three, and that's in it too in Europe too, if you have three or four really big producers of solar panels, you've got enough. And we know there's increasing returns, we know there's oligopoly, but we've got enough here to uh, essentially keep that price going on down. So as we collaborate on some issues, it seems to me that there's some competition on those other issues, particularly where there are monopoly positions, will be extremely important as well. And the other one, the other one was about heat sink. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it seems to me good economics should bring the problem to the table and say, here's the problem, and these are the kinds of ways we need to approach the problem. It shouldn't ever be one problem. Well, yeah. And I'm a great fan of Bigu. I've written papers on Bigu. Many other people in the room have written papers on Bigu and tried to take them out. You know, Marshall and Bigu got it. They made a very important statement. But to think that that's the end of the story for all the reasons I've stuck, I think you have to start with a problem and say, here's the problem, here's the difficulties, here's what economics can bring uh, to the table. And actually, it's the whole of economics. Not just some marginal force. This is what you should be assembling everything you know. Yeah, the macro, series of investment, the international trade, industrial organization, as I've just been describing. You know, economics is a great subject. We can bring all this to this uh, problem. And isn't it fun? Yeah. <laughs> I have a question about the framing of climate change in economics, because climate is both a, a tipping point issue and a scalar issue. Like, as a, we have more warming, things get worse, but also there's these tipping points and there's these reactions scientifically that will, like, create almost, like, infinite harm. And as you noted, it's, a, like, not a great fit for climate change to look at, like, marginal analysis because of these tipping points that can create infinite harm. But it's also like not a very practical perspective to go around looking at it as like climate change is a problem of infinite harm, even though that is a possibility. So like what is a, a useful and accurate way to frame the climate problem when we do economic research in order to like incorporate these like uh, big possibilities and risks, but also not like <laughs> have something that's entirely unimaginable. Yeah, you can't say it's all too difficult. We'll give up. <laughs> then, you know, you... You just have a party and write a letter of apology to your grandchildren. <laughs> but the, um, the, you know, the, 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 I tried to describe you know, when you have these risks or uncertainties about you know, extreme or you know, unmeasurable infinite harm, you have to start thinking about how can I stop getting too close to that? I can't take it away. And that's why Joe and I suggested a guardrail approach to it. And we actually were just describing what the international community has done in thinking about these issues. Led, of course, by the scientific community. We're not necessarily hamstrung by all these economic ideas. And that's where the intuition of scientists and international policymakers focus. And I think it's not bad. What we can do in economics is dig deeper and look at the, as I tried to say, the mathematical and philosophical foundation of the use of guardrails. And our dear friend Marty Weitzman was tiptoeing in, in that as well. So part of the story about tipping points and stability is just try not to get too close. And that's the guardrail. Right? But that leaves, of course, the whole. I mean, most of the policy story open. If you feel these are the right kind of targets, um, the, uh, then the story is how to get. And there, you know, the, the use of 
prices, taxes, subsidies, regulation, collaboration, all the kind of things that we've been discussing today, uh, what you need to think about. But with the story of how do you change the structure of our economy in 20 or 30 years, starting now, because this next decade is the decide. And that's the kind of problem that economics hasn't necessarily grappled with, um, but could. And I try to argue that it could, and, I, and that it's also, uh, also beginning. So I, I would try to go it that way. And remembering, you know, I mean, look, I mean the, the soon shut theorem is here, Princeton, homemade, right? And what did it tell you? It said that the relative prices you use, the kind of policies you think about, depend on where you're going to be. Yeah? That's the whole story, right? And uh, this is a, a kind of super example of all that. The kind of marginals you use, the kind of policies you use, have to have some notion of where you're going to be. Now, your analyses in economics might lead you to revise some of those ideas about where you're going to be. But that, in the context of having to move very quickly in the face of the kind of risk you describe, really does seem to be a reason to play. This one, if this one's working. Yep. Um, I think I fall into the younger generation that you were referring to um, as I look around the room. And now, you know, there's a blend. I mean, but I think I'm lower on the spectrum. I, a little bit of background, I'm an early stage VC at the very earliest stage. We write the first check into companies. We've been the most active VC into climate tech since 2019. We have 1,500 portfolio companies. The, my firm's name is SOSB. Intensive accelerator programs and then follow on financing. You see, uh, you know, I, even to a young consumer, you talk about the trend of, you know, there's a desire. There's also an economic difference from myself, who am lucky enough to have, have a mortgage. Many, you know, the, the economic standing of somebody coming out of college today, as we know, and 40 years ago, is very different. And so, you know, I want, like I today do buy most of my clothes at thrift stores. Now that's actually because I think, for a couple of reasons, because I think thrift stores are cool, but also because I know that I don't need this, that, and the other thing, and I can, but at the same time, I also know that my, gallon of gas is subsidized. I don't want to pay for a $6 gallon of gas, right? And so making it sexy to the consumer is something that I, we see across, you know, we have this, this slice of 1,500 companies, many of which touch the climate space. And it's interesting to see that battle, you know, that battle between desire and, you know, feasibility. And that was just the one thing, and I don't know if I really had a question there. I was just sort of returning. But, you know, the other thing that I see, I think, on our end is, you know, the policy begets change and change begets policy and the circular formula. Where does this start and end? You know, we see these consortiums like the one that was announced yesterday for $2.5 billion where 25 different venture capitalists are going to come together, right, and, and fund this, right? Now, they are the risk takers that you spoke of, right? And, and, and uh, you know, capital, private, you know, cap, private and capital, or I forget what you used, markets, um, won't be the full solution. It will be the central banks. But it's interesting for me because I've now gotten to see, like in the last year, a partnership with the state of New Jersey, where they're matching us dollar for dollar in investments in Newark, New Jersey, into consumer hardware specifically focused on on climate tech. Same thing in the state of New York with biotech. So we're, we're, starting, we're starting, I think, to see it at a state-to-state -state level. We took it to Texas, apparently. I wasn't there. And they kind of looked at us and said, what, what the hell are you talking about? Right? And so that unification, and, and, and that takes time. I know that if I ever have the chance to be a chief economist or general partner, whatever that may be, it'll be too late by then. Well, let, let me let me have a go. Yeah, um, sorry. <laughs> it, it's a response, you know, responding to a stream of angst. But I think <laughs> the stream of angst is is, is probably well founded. Um, and thank you for being young. I, I just uh, 
I had a, a long time, my wife and I, over this weekend with Bob Solo, who was, uh, like other people in the room, was, was one of my teachers, and I was blessed. And uh, Bob, one of Bob's foremost was that uh, there are three stages of life, young, middle-aged, and people telling you you look good. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I think I'm in the latter. <laughs> anyway, the, um, I think the, uh, the role of uh, the private sector in all this has been transformed in the last five or six years. And if people see that there's a big move in a direction, often, not all of them, of course, but someone will push back. But a lot of them will want to get ahead of the game. And that you've seen, I think, in a very big measure in the last five or six years. And it's, it's very encouraging. If you look at COP26 in Glasgow last November relative to COP21 in Paris in 2015, the presence of the private sector was extraordinarily different. And uh, many of people who are really getting out in front and driving all this uh, forward. Um, you know, just a few years ago, um, uh, Bill Gates saw, as it were, environmental concern as some kind of conspiracy against development. No, no, well, let's get on with development, you know. And, and, and Bill's committed his life to poverty reduction and, 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 and great, done some tremendous stuff. He's now out there talking about climate change. You know, the private sector has moved big time. You know, you've got the big firms that declared the net zero way before 2050 and some to pick up, as it were, the tab for what they've emitted in the past. And the, uh, you know, the, the, the joy about many innovators are right in this area. Just when, when HIV AIDS moved to center stage, you know, it became uh, a big deal and the best medics and researchers went after it. So too vaccination this time around. And now I think you're starting to see the best innovators, the best minds, the best entrepreneurs around this one. And that is, I think, a, a reason for some. In fact, and I, all the time I said, don't get carried away. But a reason for some optimism, at least about the direction of change and a picking up of the uh, pace of change. So I think that's enormously important. Um, you know, $6 a gallon sounds a lot, but Europe is way above that. Yeah, you know, and you know, there's not some kind of political impossibility uh, in the very general sense. But you know, you know, United States, the United States, you have your own politics. Other people have their their politics. But you know, the Inflation Reduction Act did seem to me to be something that shows that you know you can move in a way which is particular to that policy. China has you know grown through the Household responsibility system in the and township village enterprise in the 80s. It grew in the 90s and the early 2000s through advance into low cost manufacturing in world markets. You know, it grew really in uh, more recent times through heavy infrastructure and house building. It now sees that all those big stories are, are, are play their way through. And it now sees uh, increasingly, but we'll have to play it through for the 15 five year plan, which will be in the cooker next year, they're now seeing the green, the drive to the green growth as actually the driver of growth itself. So these political arguments and discussions are taking place in different ways in different countries. Sometimes it moves forward, sometimes it moves backwards. You know, the, the energy security story should move it forward, but some places it's moving it backwards. But those, po those politics have to play their way through. And I think the private sector's vision of what's possible and what can now happen is absolutely critical. You know, a professor of LSE goes to see the charts of the exchequer, it happens, you know, and say, this is the great growth story. Well, thank you very much, Professor Stern. That's very, very interesting. But if the investors of London and the UK, if they go there and say, look, this is tremendous opportunity. Well, we need you to help us in this way and that way. Then it gets more traction. And if they both go, then that's really good. Thank you.